Welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner. And I am Tony Schmidt. And Tony, today's episode is about the Black Panthers. And this was an episode... Nobody saw my gesture. Yeah, I know. Tony did like a black power symbol just now or like a fist. It's not necessarily... Well, I guess they did just black power, but it's also like a solidarity fist. That's true. That's what I would call it. I would call it a solidarity fist. Okay. I wonder if there's an actual term for that. That'd be a good idea. For the, the you know, because that's, mm-hmm. that's not explicitly a Black Panther. Or, I mean, they did it a lot, but yeah. you're right. it's definitely used by the left. Yeah, and then you can associate the fist with anything you want by putting a, an item in that fist. Yeah, or putting it as something like the Wisconsin fist. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyway, today's episode is about the Black Panthers, and I wanted to start by asking you what you know about the Black Panthers and what, when you first heard of them, you learned about them or, or may have mislearned about them. Boy, my, so, I don't know, it's kind of hard to know exactly what my first impressions were because, of course, I don't remember specifically and it's all muddled with the stuff I know now. So what I will say I know now about them is that they uh, were a civil rights group, normally called black nationalists, which I'm not 100% what that means. I want to say that means that they want sort of their own like a nation for African American people. Is that what that means? I think the the black nationalists. I don't know for sure, but but I think the essentially black nationalists were more about building an African American community and bettering their own community rather than integrating within the larger white community. Okay. Yeah. See, I don't because it's part of civil rights that is mentioned so little. Mm-hmm. Um, I know they. I guess I don't know if I don't think every member of the Black Panthers was Marxist, but some of their founders, like I want to say Huey Newton, mm-hmm. is that one of them? Was a Marxist. Mm-hmm. The other founders, their, I don't know what it is, their Ten Demands or whatever it is, are almost straight out of the Communist Manifesto. Yeah. Um, which is pretty awesome. Um, and yeah, like, I think, I mean, there's prominent figures I know of, like Malcolm X. Or no, he wasn't a Black Panther, was he? Was he? No, I don't think that he was. However, he was... Oh, he was... No, was he, he was, Nation of He Islam? was a black nationalist. Yeah. Um, And yeah, I, I think he was very much into Islam. Like yeah, black. was he the Nation of Islam? I okay. think so, yeah. Boy. See, tell us that... They don't. I, this is. Uh, I feel bad because I don't know a lot about this stuff, and it's something I find really interesting. Um, I know my wife has read some young adult books um, about, specifically about Malcolm X. Oh, that's awesome! I didn't yeah. know there were even young adult books for Malcolm X. Yeah, there's one that she read, and she's probably gonna correct me if she hears this. Um, that I believe it's a non-fiction story. I think it was tangentially related to him. He played a prominent role, but it was a guy who had a uh, bookstore, I think, in Harlem. Uh, and he was a prominent member of whatever the same... Like, he was sitting next to Malcolm X the day Malcolm X was executed. Wow. Or I think he might have been late. Like, he was going to, like, the same thing. Like... You know, so, like, he knew, like, Malcolm X would come and talk at his bookstore and stuff like that. And another one that she more recently read was, is a fictionalized, uh, or historical fiction of his life. Not that they took a lot of liberties with it, I don't think. I just think they don't have all the details, so they pasted them in. And there's stuff that's definitely true. Um, like, the only detail that I'm remembering that she had told me was 
Like one of his teachers said to him, oh, well, what are you going to do now that you've graduated? And he's like, oh, I don't know. I was thinking maybe about being a lawyer or something. And he said, what do you mean? You're just an N-word. I, you can't be that, you know, something like a, you know, welder or, you know, mm-hmm. trade, trade skill sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, that's not Black Panther. So otherwise, who else? Uh, is it Akata Shakur, do you know? Oh. Who's in exile in Cuba after being wrongfully accused and convicted of murdering a cop, I think in New Jersey. And now she's stuck down there, and they actually just raised the bounty on her. She's now, like, on the top ten FBI's most wanted terrorist or some such nonsense like that. And I know she's, the, like, the highest bounty for any, uh, any woman ever. Yeah, Asada. Shakur. Asada Shakur, yeah. Who's, I believe, the aunt of Tupac Shakur, the, mm. uh... Rapper. Uh, rapper from the 90s who was killed. Who, boy, I wonder if the kids these days, because, you, know, you know, I don't listen to a lot of hip-hop music, but I sure know the name uh, Tupac. I don't know if other kids these days, or if that's just the growing up in the 90s thing. Yeah, I I also never really got into rap or hip-hop music, but my friends who were, were re- really respected and and... Uh, knew a lot about Tupac. Yeah, I wonder if I shouldn't... That would probably be a good homework assignment just to go home and listen to some as if... Because if his aunt is a big radical, um, because she is, Mm -hmm. I think she's also a Marxist, but if she was a big radical, I'd be curious to see if his his stuff, his music lined up with that. I'm always looking for good radical music. If anybody has any suggestions of good radical music, I'm uh, always on the lookout. That would be a good episode, too. Radical music? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find some. Like, there's, like... Never mind. Maybe we won't di- we'll, digress yeah. too much on this. Yeah. Here, I'll name two groups. Rebel Diaz, which is hip-hop. Mm-hmm. Um, they're very good. I don't know if they're still active or not. Uh, and The Last Internationale, which is really, really good. And everybody should listen to their... Uh, stuff. In fact, you know what? I will have one of their songs be the outro to this, I think. All right. Cool. I didn't answer your whole question. First impressions of what I heard of them, I'm pretty sure all I had ever really heard about them was that they were a group who believed in civil rights through violence, Is I, I think is the extent to which I was taught in school. That they wanted their civil rights and they were going to use weapons to take them, which I know is nonsense, the weapons are, you know, they would only, they would pose with weapons, but that was a defensive thing, and for the amount of uh, their leaders who were murdered, or framed for murder, not a dumb defensive maneuver either. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, really, they are only mentioned, I'm guessing, because they were so big, and you can't not mention them. This was my experience. Which is really why I wanted to do an episode on this, because I uh, was so surprised at how different the Panthers were when I actually started researching them compared to the small pieces of information, quote unquote, that I got in I think high school. Yeah. Or it Hollywood. was never. It was never the Panther. Panthers were never mentioned in any official education I got. They were not part of any of my history classes or anything like that. So the any learning that I got, any information I got about the Panthers was just stuff that other kids told me. Yeah. And this is what other kids told me. They essentially told me that the Panthers were like the black version of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> which, you know, I think I had heard that now that you say that. Right? Yeah. Like, they believe that, like, it was sort of like they were black supremacists, the uh, Ku Klux Klan were the white supremacists. But anyway, I realize now, after having read about the Panthers and read their 10-point program and read about what they've actually done and their real actual interactions with the police, that the picture that I was given, just kind of by hearsay, 
you know, when you're little, somehow you learn about the Ku Klux Klan. I guess that is a good thing to know what's happened in the past so that you understand that context. That is something that makes it into official education. Like on Martin Luther King Day, you might learn about some, like, hate groups, essentially, and, and what's happened in the past, and, you know, people being lynched. So you know about the KKK, you learn about the KKK, and so the maybe, it might be that the kids that told me this weren't trying to spread misinformation, but just that was the easiest way to explain, like, the misunderstanding that they had. Yeah, I think um, a good example of that, too, uh, of sort of that view or closer to that view of the Black Panthers is Forrest Gump. There's a small bit where he's at like a march in Washington and like there are Black Panther people there. I don't remember if they're at a mic or if they're just talking to him, but they're just like screaming in his face at all this stuff. Um, okay, yeah, so not a favorable portrayal. Yeah, but the movie Forrest Gump I'll have to put a link to the crack thing where they discuss it's a super conservative propaganda movie. Oh. Yeah. Well, then I'm okay with the fact that I really haven't watched that movie. I've seen snippets. Not a great movie all around. And like Back to the Future, it basically takes away most things that happened from uh, black people and it gives them to, uh, ascribes the, that to white people. Uh-huh. Movie Back to the Future does that too. Like with a rock white, and roll, right? Yep. Rock and roll and... He gives suggestion to the black politician to run for mayor when he's just sweeping the floors, like in the fifties and stuff. So they're basically giving him credit for the civil rights movement as well. And it's, yeah. So I wanted to have this episode where we talk just briefly about the Panthers and kind of what they stand for and what they were about. So the Panthers, like you mentioned, were a civil rights group or uh, an activist group uh, formed in the 60s. And their full title was, you know, the, they called themselves the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. Yeah. And, okay. And they are well known for having carried guns, because they did. Uh, in fact, their very first action was to carry guns at the um, California State Capitol. And it had been made illegal to carry guns. And this is very interesting to me because within the mainstream left and the mainstream right in America, it's generally the mainstream right, like the Republicans who support guns, and the mainstream left, like Democrats, who are generally for more gun control and and would not want someone walking around a Capitol building with a loaded gun. However, this kind of flips it. Yeah. Because they, the Black Panthers carried guns for self-defense because they felt that the the police were killing their people, which they had good reason to believe that. Yeah. And in As, fact, many in the black community are starting to feel that way <laughs> again. <laughs> I was going to say, things have changed so much. Yes. And, uh, and it's, you know, hard to blame people when there are... Uh, you know, a new story comes out that makes you shake your head and wonder how that could have happened every month or so. Yeah. Or more often. I actually think here's how things have changed with that. Now, if, uh, you know, they're the right wing, like you said, is very pro-gun and they like to march around with their guns. Now, if a black person so much as holds a BB gun in a store off the shelf, they're literally shot dead for it by the police or... Child holding an obviously toy gun, shot dead within seconds. Yeah, that was Tamir Rice, right? Yes, which thankfully they're actually prosecuting the police officer for that one, who apparently had no choice but to do that, except that the video shows him clearly pulling up, getting out, shooting him dead. Wow. Because, of course, a 12-year-old would be carrying a gun around in a park. So... Another reason why I felt that this was a pertinent topic to choose now was because of the the Black Lives Matter movement and the recent police actions that have gotten a lot of attention that, you know, basically it's it's a very interesting topic right now and a very pertinent topic to talk about relation race relations in America, especially 
when it comes to police as well. Because the Panthers had a particular take on it, right? Like, they were going to carry guns for self-defense because they felt like they needed to. And now, when, uh, like, for example, the protests in Baltimore, when there was even a hint of non of non peaceful protest you know when when there may have been some property damage and things like that the people come out and chastise you know the every, everyone comes out and and wants to denounce that and i should say that i am not necessarily for property damage i don't want someone to throw a brick through my window that sucks It really would suck to have to replace all of my windows. You know what would suck more, though? Being shot dead by a policeman. Yeah. (laughs) That would be a lot worse. So, while it's okay to, you know, say that, okay, we need to be civil and not break windows and things like that, you need to put things in context. Because if you felt like a policeman could walk up to you and kill you for no reason and get away with it, then you might not be so worried about some broken windows. And I think that's that's putting putting it in context. <clears throat> Along those same lines, the the media seems to have been particularly ready to denounce the protesters for having used violence. There was um a clip I heard on NPR where they were discussing um a clip from one of the major news networks, one of the corporate ones, CBS, I think. And the uh, anchor is interviewing uh, an African-American gentleman, and they're basically trying to make the interviewee denounce the protesters. Like, it's very clear that that's what the interviewer wants Mm -hmm. to have happen. And then the interviewer specifically says that. The interviewer says, I want you to say that the protesters should be nonviolent, which is, I think, unprecedented. You know, that's maybe not unprecedented, but it's, it's the kind of thing that a reporter should not be saying. Like, the point of an interview is, is not for the interviewer to tell the interviewee what they should be saying. Like, that really surprised me. Yeah. Well, I, like, I know that the media is very crooked, but that is, that's a level of crookedness that I would expect everyone in the newsroom to look at and say, oh, we can't put this on the air. This is ridiculous. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, the way they deal with that stuff, especially yeah, with the denunciation of violence, is essentially, it's going back to, you know, the sort of racist dehumanizing of a group. It's, well, they are feral, animalistic, primal group, and to show us that you are not of that, you must denounce it to show that you are more enlightened like the mainstream white view. Well, the other thing is that there is an assumption of nonviolence now that I think can be used as a really effective handicap, right? Like, yeah. when Martin Luther King was non for nonviolent protest, that was, like, a big thing. You know, that made people really respectful because they could see, oh, hey, black people are getting dogs sicked on them and are being, you know, blasted with fire hoses and, you know, and being lynched in some places. So to respond to that with nonviolence was... Mind blowing, but now the assumption is that you that if you are an oppressed group, you will every single one every single person in your group will always respond with nonviolence a hundred percent of the time, and whenever they don't, then it can justify any sort of brutality like, against you. Not only do you have to respond with nonviolence if you are nonviolent, you have to accept the vicious attacks from the police, like Cecily McMillan is a good example, being molested by a cop, got her in jail, or the pepper spraying of students for Occupy Wall Street stuff, like which campus was, I don't remember what campus it is, where the cops, like, gets the pepper spray up, blasts them all, loads up another one, blasts them all. Like, not only do you have to be nonviolent, you have to be nonviolent 
and you know that they're going to dehumanize you, break all of your rights, uh, and attack you, and that it's okay because you're protesting. The act of protesting not only has to be nonviolent, but you have to accept the violence against you. That's right. Again, like as in Baltimore. Because, you know what, if somebody's coming at me with a fucking tank and on a horse with a billy club, I'm probably not just going to stay there. Like, mm -hmm. I would not be surprised. I'm surprised not everyone erupted in violence at things like that. Because you have, in those cases, especially with the Baltimore where they roll out the tanks and stuff like that, you have basically a military oppression of the people. You have a military coming in and oppressing everyone. Yep. And I think, you know, let's say uh, Russia rolls its military into uh, Alaska. We're not going to say, oh, everybody in Alaska, you should peacefully resist that. That's an act of war, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. The American Revolution would not have happened if, if the Founding Fathers said, okay, let's all nonviolent protest. You know, maybe it would have. I guess the the, the, the counterexample is India. But it took a lot longer for India to gain independence. And was no less brutalized. Yes. So, I guess my point, I, I need to say this. That I'm not saying that violence is a good thing. But I think that when we make the response to violence to be nonviolence by assumption... That we are taking away something that, 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 you know, what used to be something that we could look at and say, wow, in the face of violence, these people respond nonviolently. And that brought massive respect and support to that group. Now people feel the need that they can oppress you and then kind of lecture you about morality if you respond with even the tiniest bit of violence to however much, you know, that you you can be oppressed brutally. And if you, you know, break a window or run away from a cop, these are sometimes what violence means is, you know, not, I wouldn't even call running away violence, but, you know, the, the meaning of violence drastically changes depending on who you're talking to and what they're talking about yeah so i wanted to bring up the panthers because this is the they were another thing they were they were the other side to martin luther king you know same thing with malcolm x he was kind of the most prominent uh, uh person but the the panthers were were involved as well and you know, there's an argument to be made that it's more effective when you have both. When you have a person who can appeal to nonviolence and the group, I'm not going to say that appeals to violence, because I don't think that that's what the Panthers stood for, but stood for self-defense. Yeah. You know, They're you... not going to sit there and take it. Yeah. They're I mean, going to d d exercise their right to defend themselves as yeah. opposed to their right to die. Yeah, because what nonviolence really means is that you are are not willing to defend yourself uh, or or just or choosing not to defend yourself and that's okay that's a legitimate strategy and if that's what you believe then that's fine to believe that but when you put that burden on a group to say that they must be nonviolent then you're saying that that group is not allowed to defend itself and you have to be realize that that's what you're saying when you like, wave that expectation of nonviolence on an oppressed group. Okay, let's talk about some stuff that the Panthers actually did. This was the, the, one of the biggest revelations for me. Well, let's start with this. The Panthers, as you mentioned, were a Marxist group with uh, a Marxist uh, theory. In fact, we should talk briefly about their 10-point program. All right. So this is the party platform. I'm mildly familiar with this, so I'm excited. <laughs> okay, good. Number one, we want freedom. We want the power to determine the destiny of our black community. Point two, we want full employment for our people. I'll, read, I'll just read the short version. There's a long, I mean, I'll read the long version of this, this one. 
This one's good. We believe that the federal government is responsible and obligated to give every man employment or a guaranteed income. Probably should be updated to man or woman, but we'll let that go. We believe that if the white American businessman will not give full employment, that the means of production should be taken from the businessman and placed in the community uh, so that the people of the community can organize and employ all of its people and give a high standard of living. I really like that one. Now, if that's not Marxism, I don't know what is. <laughs> And and they don't they're not saying they're they're very clear that they they are Marxist and and took a lot of their uh, points from Marx. Three, we want an end to the robbery by the capitalists of our black community. Four, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings, and this is another one where if the the if the market and capitalists and white landlords as they call them cannot be cannot uh provide adequate housing then it must be taken over by the community five we want education for our people that expresses the true nature of this decadent american society that was a word they used a lot decadent back then and we want the education that teaches us our true history and our role in present day society which is the, there's a, a mixture there, I think, of including education about black people, but also education about that that empowers people. Yeah, that also sounds a little like Maoist to me. That one actually, they they were very much a Maoist group. They okay. they uh, one of they would raise funds by selling the little red book. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Now imagine trying to make money by selling Mao's little red book today. I'm sure somebody does it, but probably not very many people. Six, we want all black men to be exempt from military service. And, you know, that's kind of very particular to the time because Vietnam was going on. Yeah. And and that was, you know, the, the Panthers' stance on that was essentially that we're poor black people oppressed by our society who have are forced to, to kill other non-white people oppressed by... America and then the people in control of their society. Uh, we want an immediate end to the police brutality and murder of black people. We want freedom for all black men. We want all black people when brought to trial to be tried in a court by a jury of their peer group or people from their black communities as defined by the Constitution of the United States. Yeah, that is something that is often uh, overlooked with juries is jury of your peers is taken just be other americans Mm -hmm. and especially then it was all white americans yep and this one actually if you you go into the detail the the little paragraph that goes on to explain it is basically points out over and over again that all they want is what is guaranteed by the constitution you know the there's not many times that they uh, highlight the constitution actually we'll get to a couple more but um or one more, but that one's interesting because a lot of the language isn't necessary. You know, the, you can see the influence from Marx. You can see the influence from Black nationalism, and here's an influence from the American Revolution. Yeah. Number ten. Speaking of influences, here's another one. We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. Boy, who does that sound? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For for our listeners who might not be familiar. Land, bread, and peace was the demands of the Bolshevik party for the Russian Revolution. So this is like that, except for there's three more in the middle, or four more. They didn't think Housing it was edu- enough. <laughs> What's it? They didn't think the three was enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, why stop there? You also need to have housing, education, clothing, and justice. They're good yeah. additions. Yeah. But it's not as snappy when you have seven things. Yeah. And then it, it's also straight plagiarism if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of straight plagiarism, at the end of this document uh, begins a section that starts: "We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal." Blah 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 blah. And it's basically a whole paragraph just lifted from the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, uh, I like it when people throw things like that back in other people's faces. Yeah, yeah. The I language mean, of the oppressor arguing against itself. And I uh, I think it's very interesting. I would love I we this I'm almost tempted to get a right wing person on the show so they can 
tell us what they think of this, because this is the language that the right loves to use. They love to use the Constitution and the American Revolution. They like guns. I want to know what a right-wing person thinks about the Panthers. So the other thing that really surprised me about the Panthers when I started learning about them was the other things that they did. So they carried guns because they believed that they needed to have them for self-defense. And I think that there is an argument to be made for that. I think there's a great argument to be made for that. Yeah, because if if your people are being uh, murdered by police who aren't held accountable for their actions, then it may in fact make sense to arm yourself. Now, in today's society, with our political climate, I don't know if that's the right path to take. I'd, I'd be interested to know what other people think, because I don't actually have a strong opinion either way, because it's a question of what's the right move, and I don't know. It could There could be backlash by making that move, or, or maybe it would make sense to do it. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting that the right-wing gun rights movement is that they probably would be very opposed to black people carrying guns, it yeah. seems, because... The, the way they have the argument set up is that you are allowed to use your gun in self-defense. It's there for self-defense, anything you feel threatened by. However, white people who carry guns apparently are threatened by black people. So, according to their own stuff, it's okay to shoot black people because you're threatened by them. So if they start carrying guns, then you'd really be threatened by them. It, yeah, exactly. That's That's m my kind of thought is... Well, what if black people all do carry guns in self-defense, but even if they do, and then a policeman kills one, and then they find that he was carrying a gun, maybe even the policeman didn't know at the time, but if they find later he was carrying a gun, that will probably justify it in the minds of some people. Oh yeah, most of the shootings, it's, oh, we thought he had a gun, or he looked like he could have been reaching for a gun. Whereas, what if you're legally allowed to have a gun? Mm-hmm. Yeah, which in many places you are. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, I also think you'd get a lot more people calling the cops if they saw a black person with a gun than a white person with a gun. Oh, yeah. Although, I don't know about you, I've not really encountered many people who open carry. The only person I've seen open carrying was a white guy, and I was terrified I was going into a Starbucks with my son, and the guy punches the door open. Not pushes the door, punches the door to open it. Like, just super aggressively. Clearly very angry. I don't know if he has a gun strapped to his hip. I'm like, well, that is the last person that should have a gun, is somebody who's going to punch a door open. There, so if, if you're into gun control or things like that, there was um, this great... Uh, argument that I saw somebody make that said, okay, yeah, it may be legal to carry guns, but this is my stance on guns. If I am at an establishment and somebody carrying a gun walks in, I will just leave immediately, quietly, without saying anything. I won't wait for the check if I haven't paid my check yet. I will just get up and leave. Uh, because, the person argues, you don't know if that person is there to kill someone. Maybe they are, maybe not. Some people go into, like, let's say, a movie theater and decide to kill everyone in it. And they, ha if they have a gun, sometimes they kill a lot of them. And sometimes a person may be carrying a gun and they sit down at a restaurant and eat their food and leave and nothing bad happens. But you never know. So the most reasonable thing to do is simply to just leave quickly and as quietly as possible. And that was, you know, that would be the incentive for those businesses to not allow someone to carry a gun on their premise because it may, it would make the, you know, their uh, other customers feel uncomfortable, feel nervous, and leave without spending their money. Yeah. Like these gun protests where they come in, like with AK, I guess not AK 47, not AK 47, like the AR, the non automatic uh, M16s. Hmm. If a group of people came in with that to a restaurant I was at, I would scream, dive under the table, or try and run away with my kids and call 911. I would think that we're all going to get killed. I, I honestly would. I, it'd be terrifying. Yeah. Which, according to their justifications, by the way, would make it okay for me to shoot them. 
<laughs> right? If you're a policeman. No, no. If you just carry a gun, like that's the whole point, is that if you have a gun to defend yourself against threats or perceived threats, so if somebody busts and comes into a place with a gun, I could be so scared I could shoot them justifiably. That's Yeah, that might be somebody's justification, but that's not the law, unless you're a policeman. Well, with the stand your ground laws and stuff, it is the law. Oh, okay. Yeah, with stand your ground, if you feel reasonably threatened and somebody with a gun is a reasonable threat then it's okay to shoot them dead because you're terrified of them. Wow. Yeah, no, it's just it's trying a good to idea. make a big shootout yeah. thing. Anyway. So one of the things that impressed me the most, most about the Panthers when I started learning about them was the other things that they did besides carry guns and have their, you know, Marxist 10 points or largely Marxist 10 points. Uh, one of the programs that they're very famous for is their free breakfast for school children program. Monsters. Right? <laughs> and not only is it a nice thing, you know, it's nice to provide food for school children. There's a lot of really good reason to do this. One is if you, if your family is under the poverty line, your family might not have breakfast at home. That's likely, in fact. And there's lots of research to show that you don't participate as effectively in education if you don't have breakfast. Like, you actually physically can't learn as well. Like, it, and that shouldn't really be a surprise. You know, it might be that with, there's been studies on it. But if you just imagine sometime when you're really, really hungry, are you actually concentrated on the thing that's supposed to be going on at that time? No, you're just watching the clock. Can't wait till lunch rolls around. Or, or whatever. So the, the fact that they provided food to school children was not just a nice thing to do and a nutritional thing and a healthy thing was improving their education as well. So to, to do that, I think, was wonderful. And also it shows a sense of community. You know, the, the idea of if no one else is going to do it, we're going to step up and do it and make sure it gets done and we're going to do it as a community. And that's, you know, I, I feel like they're they're at that moment they're living up to their Marxist principles. They're living up to what they say they stand for. You know that that in my mind that's the thing that if more people knew that would legitimize the group to them. Yeah. You know, like if if the one thing that I learned in high school was not that the Panthers were the black version of the KKK, which was BS anyway. They weren't. You know, nothing in their 10-point program says we need to lynch white people or that, that, that black people are superior to white people in any way. It doesn't say that. But if what I had learned is that they were the group that provided food to people who needed food, that's a whole different story. That's a very different picture to paint. Yeah, they go from um, monsters to uh, the Red Cross. Yeah. Except Red Cross is a bad example. <laughs> it's, they're pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, I heard they, were, they had like a scandal recently or something. Oh, God, with the Haiti stuff, vast mismanagement of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars that they're supposed to be spending for housing that they claim they housed like a hundred and some thousand people. They've built six houses. That's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so here's a, a short list of other things they were involved in. These were in Chicago because uh, they, they they had um, some stuff out in California, obviously. That's, uh, I think, kind of where it started. But they had branches, uh, you know, throughout the U.S. And here's some stuff they did in Chicago. They helped establish a free medical center. They did door-to-door -door health services to te test for sickle cell um, anemia. And they also encouraged blood drives in the community. Uh, so, well, just a few other good things that they did. Yeah. And finally, I feel like I, will, I want to address briefly the their conflicts with the police. Now, the details of the Panthers' conflicts with the police are have never been something that have particularly interested me. But I think it's something that can come up when talking about them. And especially with, you know, the carrying the guns for self-defense and things like that. 
There have been a lot of accusations by the police that the Panthers were killing cops or attempted to kill cops, things like that. If you look into it, or in my experience, having looked into it a bit, there's reason to believe that a lot of those accusations were BS. And I wasn't there, so I don't know. But there's certainly reasonable doubt that the Panthers were actively trying to attack any police officers. For example, uh, two Panthers who were killed by the police, um, some use the term assassinated, Fred Hampton and and another Panther were in their house, and the police uh, came in, broke in while they were sleeping, and killed both of them. And the a report of the crime scene showed that 90 shots were fired in the house. Oh. Uh, and one of them, they determined, had come from a panther's gun. <laughs> and so that would leave the other 89, I don't know, probably by the police. It's funny, in the rules of, uh, like, the official, like, international rules for war, there's part about proportional retaliation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of feel like there should be that for... Usually they go good with the protests, too. Proportional retaliation. Mm-hmm. People peacefully assemble. You don't assemble cops and tanks. <laughs> right. The... So, you know, maybe... Maybe a panther shot first. They could have. I mean, if I were a black panther, and I know that other black black panther members had been killed by the police, and I woke up, and there were police breaking down my door... I'm, I may have decided that it was a fight for my life. You might not even know it's the police either. That's true. But... I mean, movies the... say that they shout police, but... Mm-hmm. One, I don't know if they actually have to do that, and two, I'm sure they didn't then. <laughs> yeah. And so, maybe they did, maybe they didn't, you know, and then, and whether it was the actions of a group or just a few individuals in the group is you know, another thing to look at. But what we know for sure is that police definitely did kill some Panthers because we know they killed Fred Hampton and and a, uh, Mark, who is another, I don't have his last name here, but Fred Hampton and, and uh, his housemate. And uh, Bobby Hutton was also assassinated. And a lot of these Panthers were really young. Some were only 17 when they were killed by the police. Jeez. So, okay. Going back to the one shot versus 90, mm-hmm. did you see that recently a cop was let off for killing a black couple? He uh, Was this in Cleveland? It might have been. It's, he fired 137 shots at their vehicle, yes. which backfired, and he took as a gunshot, and then I don't even know how he had that many bullets with him. Like, there, it was I not literally one don't. It was not one police officer. It was like 13 police officers that officers that were involved in this. Hey. Because I, I watched the part of the trial because it happened to be on the TV when I was getting new tires put on my car. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I watched the whole thing. And what it boiled, it, that flabbergasted me because what it boiled down to at the end was if the policeman feels threatened, you then, can murder. Yeah, then you can shoot anyone you want. And that's, you know, it it might make sense to say that, because otherwise, how are you going to define when a policeman can shoot and not? I don't have a good system for that. But it does mean that our current system, all the policeman needs to do is say, I felt threatened, and they can get away with whatever they want. Right. But by definition, their job is being put in threatening positions. So I think that's always a pretty, that's not a valid excuse for me because you're taking a job where you know your life might be put on the line, although it is actually less risky than some other jobs like being a coal miner, Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting too if you put it in like those sort of perspectives because pretty sure they wouldn't feel sympathy for a coal miner who went and shot his boss because he's dying of lung cancer, you know. Yeah, yeah. Even though he was directly threatened by his employment over... (laughs) You know, because the average police officer never fires their gun once. So, man, if I was a police officer, that would be my goal. Yeah, I also would. Not, yeah, I wouldn't ever be a police officer. No. 
Yeah. I imagine it would be an extremely difficult and really annoying job. Everyone, because part of the part of the part that one thing that would be the worst is basically no one's ever happy to see you. Yeah. It's like the being a dentist, but worse. Yeah. With all these shootings, though, like it gets to the point with the police where like, it makes me wonder like, what does somebody have to do before I actually would call the police on them? Like, I don't want to call police, like, for a noise complaint. Or, I, you know, I never want to. If it's my neighbors being too loud, I try and go and tell them to shut up. Um, but, like, you know, what level does something have to be at now for just the general population to call the police? I mean, that's that's another thing with that is yeah. whatever. If you, if you assume policing is actually safe and effective with all the shootings... It makes it so like, man, if I saw some black kids who were just sort of, I don't know, maybe they were stealing a car or something. I don't know if I'd want to call them or white kids. I don't know if I'd want to. Right. Like what level of crime has to be going on for me to be like, well, the police could potentially shoot these people for this. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if, I would feel off. Like if I. I also if I, almost no crime. So. Right. Yeah. Like if I saw if i saw a black kid like steal a candy bar from a grocery store and i thought if i report this they might get shot and die i would feel awful if i reported that and that's what happened or even if they were stealing a car i probably would still feel awful like i don't think anyone should be shot and killed for stealing a car yeah although you know th- it's weird how people are like the things you're allowed to say, like with the, his name escapes my mind. Unfortunately, the guy who was shot in Walmart looking at like the BB gun on the shelf. Do you remember that one? So Mm-mm. he was walk, he was in Walmart and like somebody had, I guess, un, op, unboxed one of the BB guns and it was sitting on the shelf, like, you know, where it's sold. Mm-hmm. And so he, picked up and he was looking he's just like on the phone with I don't remember it was his mom or his girlfriend or something mm-hmm. well a white customer calls the police and like they have the audio lined up you can find it lined up with the video he's like oh my god there's a black guy in here with a gun he's pointing at like little kids so the guy's just like on the phone the gun's like pointed at the ground like it's obviously something he pulled off the shelf like a kid just walks past and he's like oh my god he's pointing it right at their face and so, like, that's the reason the police came in and murdered the guy is because they thought he was a black man with an assault rifle pointing it at people and threatening them. Wow. Because this person was just blatantly lying on the phone. Uh-huh. The person who I do not believe has gotten in any trouble in any way, shape, or form, nor the officers. Yeah. But you're I mean, just I've, allowed yeah. to lie like that and everybody just goes, hmm. Yeah, because at that point, if you're an officer and you think the person is holding a real gun... Although they also say to drop it, he immediately drops it, and then they shoot him. So, oh. <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's that's a different thing. There's I that as well. Yeah. I can imagine an officer coming in with assuming the worst in that situation because the person had portrayed the worst, which I, yeah, to, to call in and say that, that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's not, you know, that's not something that should stand. Okay, anyway... I wanted to end with another uh, reading of official Black Panther publication. This is the Black Child's Pledge. So, if if you ever if you want a, a nice alternative to the Pledge of Allegiance, you could maybe update this instead of instead of you know uh, black people, you could have working class people, and it would fit really well for your son if you if you need a new Pledge of Allegiance for him instead of the the one to the U.S., you could do something like this. Okay. This is the original from the Black Panthers. I pledge allegiance to my black people. I pledge to develop my mind and body to the greatest extent possible. I will learn all that I can in order to give my best to my people in their struggle for liberation. I will keep myself physically fit, building a strong body free from the drugs and other substances which weaken me and make me less capable of protecting myself, my family, and my black brothers and sisters. I will unselfishly share my knowledge and understanding with them in order to bring about change more quickly. I will discipline myself to direct my energies 
constructively rather than wasting them in idle hatred. I will train myself never to hurt or allow others to harm my black brothers and sisters, for I recognize that we need every black man, woman, and child to be physically, mentally, and psychologically strong. These principles I pledge to practice daily and to teach them to others in order to unite my people. Nice. That's inspiring, I think. So, yeah, I like that. But saying to change that up for a workers thing makes me think of um, Ralph Miliband, the uh, Marxist father of the now resigned, or the former leader of the Labour Party in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um. I believe swore a blood oath on the grave of Karl Marx to the working people. Wow. I imagine he had something like that in his mind when he did that. Uh huh. Unfortunately, that blood oath did not uh, include training your kid not to be an idiot. But mm-hmm. you know, what are you going to do? You can only, you can only hope that your kids do so well. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, compared to the pledging allegiance to a nation or a God that may or may not exist depending on your feelings and a nation that may do things in your interest or not pledging yourself to your people and the, and, and people in your community or whoever, you know, you define your people to be is a good thing. Yeah. Well, normally. Yeah. I mean, to the exclusion of all other people, that right. is where it becomes a bad thing. Yeah, exactly. I spend my whole life Picket line, screaming workers unite. Don't give up the fight. Workers of the world unite, unite. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA, and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at RedWagner2, that's the number 2, and SchmidtAJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page facebook.com slash dsamadison Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.